Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good morning. I know everybody wishes it would just rain one more time this month. Uh, welcome to the Beacon of Christ Church. My name's Jerry, and I'm just here this morning to do the uh, welcome and announcements and then to introduce our guest speaker this morning. Um, first, we're having a movie night planning session uh, on the 21st of this month uh, after the service in the library. And the idea is that we're going to have a movie night here at the church and invite the community. Uh, the meeting on the 21st is to decide exactly, obviously, what movie to have and then how to do the arrangements. All right. And we're also having a ministry meeting on the 24th at 7 p.m. Please be here. We're going to update uh, the church on everything that's going on and the direction that we have moving forward. And please pick up your OCC list in the foyer. Um, we are doing our Operation uh, Christmas Child Shoebox, as everybody knows. My wife Diana did an, an hour presentation uh, on the shoebox ministry. And the most important thing to remember is that we are not only blessing children around the world with something for Christmas, but we are sharing the gospel, which at the end of the day is the most important thing because you're talking about their eternal life rather than just the life here. But if any of you have watched any of the videos on the shoebox presentation, you guys know how awesome that ministry is and how it touches lives. And I know the reason I got involved in it is I saw a child who was not talking about the wonderful presents or the gifts or the toys that he got, but he was talking about living in an orphanage and for the first time in his life, he had his own bar of soap. And I'm telling you what, folks, we don't even think about things like that. We just have all that stuff. So anything that you can give, anything that you can do, and any way you can support that ministry, we would ask you to do that. With us this morning is Randy Chestnut. Randy graduated and attended Clear Creek Baptist College with our pastor, Ron, and he has pastored churches in both Kentucky and Ohio. Now, Randy's better, better half, Denise, is not with him this morning, uh, but if she were, I'm sure she would certainly outshine Randy, right, Randy? <laughs> But Randy is currently the executive director of the Life Enrichment Center in Dayton. And I would just like you to give a warm welcome uh, to Brother Randy as he comes. And then we are going to uh, start with Crystal, who is going to lead us in worship. And then we're going to have Randy come. Crystal, if you will.
Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It is a privilege to be with you today. I want to thank Pastor Ron for the opportunity to come. As uh, Jerry mentioned, Ron and I were classmates at Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. In uh, 1986, we entered our first year at Clear Creek Baptist Bible College, and that is hard to say. <laughs> 1986. My goodness, that's a lifetime ago. And uh, but uh, I always appreciated Ron and, and his family, and uh, and enjoyed our time. I'll tell you a quick funny story about me and Ron. Our freshman year at Clear Creek, uh, our class was meeting, and we were electing class officers. And uh, Ron and I were both nominated as uh, class president. We were just going into our freshman year. And so they had us both step outside the room and they had the election and Ron was elected our class president. And so then they had nominations for class vice president. Well, I was nominated and uh, another gentleman was nominated so they had us walk outside the room again to have the vote. Well, there was some laughter. Walk back in, and the other person had been elected. <laughs> then I think what they did, they did just out of meanness, because we had to allow, uh, elect a class secretary. Somebody nominated me and somebody nominates. They made me walk back outside the room, <laughs> and I heard just this hilarious laughter, which I knew what had happened, and they elected the other person. <laughs> so <laughs> I got over it. I got over it. But uh, I remember that. Uh, I don't know if Ron would remember that, but I sure do. And we had a great time, Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. Going into our uh, second year, we uh, took systematic theology together under the teaching of Dr. Jackson Robertson. Dr. Robertson was actually an attorney when he was called into the ministry. And uh, he was a great teacher. I ended up being his grader my senior year at Clear Creek. I uh, love Dr. Robertson. Dr. Robertson was a widower. His wife actually died of cancer while he was uh, instructor there at Clear Creek before we got there. Uh, Dr. Robertson was a stickler for detail. You had to earn 100 uh, on his test. If you got 100, every I had to be dotted, every T had to be crossed. Uh, literally, and so uh, love Dr. Robertson. Uh, love systematic theology, and remember, I, we were in our late twenties at that time, and so loved studying uh, about uh, God. I, I was actually raised uh, Roman Catholic, and so systematic theology kind of reminded me of my catechism classes when I was younger. In fact, Dr. Robertson said in one of our classes. He said, how many of you grew up in a tradition other than Southern Baptist where you took catechism? And it was me and a couple other people. And he said, you will have an easier time with systematic theology than those of us that were raised Baptist. And that was the truth. Uh, I so much enjoyed it. Enjoyed studying about God. You know, theology actually is the study of God. And so we studied about the character of God, um, God's essence, that that God is uh, self-existent. God doesn't need anything outside of himself to exist. Uh, God is immense. In other words, you can't put God in a box. God is eternal. There was never a time where God was not. There will never be a time when God will not be. He is eternal. Love studying about the attributes of God. Uh, for instance, God's omnipresence. What does that mean? That God is present at all times and all places. God's omnipotence. That God is great in power. There is no limit to his power. Uh, God's omniscience. God knows all things. And then this immutability. God does not change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But the older I get, it's not that those things are not as important. I've grown to appreciate more and more what are called the moral attributes of God. For instance, his goodness, his love, 
his mercy, his grace. And what I want to talk to you today about is the gentleness of God. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. This particular passage, for the past couple of years, I just find myself going back to it and back to it again. The Gospel of Matthew is the Gospel that was written to the Jews primarily, Jewish Christians, and it was to prove that Christ, that Jesus was the Christ, the promised Messiah. And so Matthew quotes more Old Testament scriptures than any of the other Gospel writers. About 50 different quotes from the Old Testament. Eight alone from the book of Isaiah. And in the passage we look at today, there's a quote from Isaiah chapter 42. Matthew chapter 12, verse 15. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Aware of what? That the Pharisees were conspiring together how to destroy him. And many followed him, and he healed them. And ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Now listen to this description of Jesus. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory, and his name, and in his name, the Gentiles will hope. I believe people are more fragile today than any time in my lifetime. I believe every person could have a sign hung around their neck that says, fragile, handle with care. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus gives this description of himself. For I am meek and lowly in heart, the King James Version says. Newer translations say it this way. I am gentle and lowly in heart. I wonder how many politicians today would get elected saying that about themselves. Not too many, right? I mean, you listen to the average politician describe themselves. And uh, I don't know about you, but there's always a commercial on about some politician wanting to get elected, right? They're tough-minded. They're a success. They're patriotic. They're not a pushover. I wonder how many would get elected if they said, you know, if I really had to describe myself, I'd, I'd say I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Well, guess what? Jesus has, doesn't have to worry about being elected to anything. He's been appointed the king. Our text, Jesus, the scripture says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen. Now I know that we can't put Jesus in a box any more than we can put God in a box. But when Jesus described himself, and by the way, when the Bible talks about our heart, it's not just talking about our emotions, it's talking about the core of who we are that Jesus is gentle and lowly in heart. How did Jesus relate to sinners and sufferers? Repentant sinners that came in. Now, could, could Jesus be tough? Absolutely, Jesus could be tough. Uh, Jesus could turn over the tables when he saw injustice being done. 
But when it came to dealing with people that were suffering, when it came to people that were being that were hurting, when it came to people who were repenting, Jesus was gentle and lowly in heart. I think about, for instance, the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. What did the law say? She should be stoned. What did Jesus say? He who has sin, he who has no sin among you, let him cast the first stone. What did Jesus say to that woman? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He dealt with her gently. I think about people that came to Jesus in all manner of sickness and all manner of illness just prior to the passage that we read Jesus was uh, in a synagogue and there was a man there with a paralyzed hand the Bible says a withered hand now that would be difficult even in our day but think about what it meant in that day in that day it meant that he couldn't work we don't know if the man was married. We don't know how old the man was. But we know for sure that his life was hampered because of this paralyzed hand. How did Jesus deal with that man? He healed him. Lepers came to Jesus. He healed them. The blind came to Jesus. He gave them sight. In Matthew chapter 11... The last two verses, Jesus says this, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I read this week about the state of mental health in America. Every year a report is issued on the state of mental health in America. And as you would suspect, it's not good. It's not good right now. Just prior to the pandemic, one out of five Americans were struggling with their mental health. The report also said that one in 20 people had seriously considered suicide. Our young people are struggling with their mental health. The report says that 15% of youth experienced a major depressive episode. You just can't hardly pick up the, the paper or go online and read the news without reading a story about some young person that took their life. In fact, last year, I remember there was a uh, among female athletes, college athletes, several had taken their life. Why is this? What's going on? Because people are fragile. It's like that description that, that's given in the text here of, 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 of a bruised reed. What's a bruised reed? Well, it, it's, it's that stem of the plant that's almost broken. It's not quite snapped off. There's still hope that it could be repaired, it could, but it, it's just, it's bruised. It's almost broken. What's a, the smoking flax? Well, that remember, that's where the light came from, the lamps, the oil lamps, and so the flax was actually the wick. And the picture here of the fire just about gone out. I think that actually describes a lot of people. You look into their eyes and maybe at one, at one time there was fire in those eyes and there was life in those eyes and, and now it just looks like the spark is just about gone, right? They're, they're struggling. That, that bruised reed, they're just about broken. They're just about ready to snap. You know, the truth is we don't really know what is going on in one another's life, right? We, we put on good faces. We go to church and uh, we're around folks and we figure people don't want to be bothered with our problems. So 
so we just do what? We just muddle through. We just make it through. Somebody said, if this was a person's life, this is about how much we actually know about their life. See, some of you sitting here, you're struggling. Some of you watching online, you're struggling. You're like that bruised reed. You're like that smoking flax. You know, somebody, uh, somebody said this, said we're either going into trouble, we're in trouble, we're coming out of trouble, or the phone's about to ring. Right? For some of you, the phone rang this week a child grandchild parent a lot of uh, people my age are taking care of their, their parents now and having to make tough decisions relating to the care of their parents my wife's in-laws lived with us for uh, about four years her mother has dementia now we're no longer able to care for her at home and my wife went to see her yesterday and most days she doesn't recognize Denise anymore. Some of you know what that's like. Some of you have dealt with that. You're dealing with that. You're like that bruised reed. You're like that smoking flax. How, how does the Lord deal with you? How does the Lord handle you, work with you? Jesus says, I'm gentle and I'm lowly in heart. What I want to do today is drop back to chapter 11 and, and I want you to see an invitation that Jesus gives and a promise that Jesus gives. And here's the invitation. Come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Now if everything's just going perfectly in your life if you have no problems if it's just been you're just on the top of, if it's all rainbows and lollipops and you know everything's going, going great this message is not for you but tuck it away because at some point you're going to need it. Jesus says come unto me. Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't, that he doesn't say, now come unto religion. Come and, and get your life lined up right. Get your act right. Clean up your act. And after you do that, then come to me. No, Jesus says, come to me. How do we come to him? We come to him as the old hymn says, just as we are. Just as I am. You see, religion says what? Religion says, clean up your life and come to God. Jesus says, come unto me and I'll clean up your life. That's the difference. Jesus says, come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden. Just weighted down with what? Maybe weighted down with the guilt and the shame of our sin. Jesus says, come unto me. Weighted down with the cares of life, weighted down with the burdens of life. Jesus says, come unto me. We come just as we are. You see, I, I, I think what's happened in a lot of churches is we've gotten so used to putting on the fake face, the phony face, that we want everybody to think that we've got it all worked out and everything's just going great in our life. That's We don't come to Jesus like that, do we? We come what? Broken? Burdened? And why, why is it that Jesus was so attractive to messed up folks? You ever think about that? Because they knew he... He would welcome me. 
There's a campaign going on right now across the country, and it's called He Gets Me. He Gets Me. What's that mean? It means that Jesus understands me. What does that mean? The Bible says that he was tempted and tested and tried in all points as we are yet without sin. He gets us. The Bible says we don't have a high priest who can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You see, the, those, those Old Testament priests, many of them lived separated, isolated lives from the people. But Jesus knows what it means to be lonely. Jesus knows what it means to be rejected. Jesus knows what it means to be ostracized and Jesus says, come to me. When, when you're having a tough time, when you're having a trial, when you're going through a difficulty, who do you want to talk to? Do you want to talk to somebody that has no idea what you've gone through? No, nobody wants to do that. Why do we have support groups? I, I, I know there are all kinds of support groups that are out there, right? Grief recovery support groups. Alzheimer's care support groups. So why do we... Why do we go to those people? Because those people have all the answers? No. Because they know what it's like to go through those problems. And, and Jesus says, come unto me. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus' invitation is, come unto me. And the second thing he says is, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of, now again, I love theology. I love studying the great doctrines of the faith. But the Bible says a relationship with God is more than knowing about God. It's knowing God. Jesus said, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. See, my question to you today is, do you know Jesus? Not do you know about Jesus. I was saved when I was 19 years old. But I was raised, I was raised to believe in Jesus. If you would ask me, before I was saved, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? I would have told you yes. Do you believe he was born of a virgin? Yes. Do you believe he lived a sinless life? Yes. Do you believe he was crucified, buried, rose from the dead, I would have told you yes. Was I saved? No. Because I knew about Jesus. I didn't know Jesus. On April 7th, 1979, I met Jesus. You see, do you know Jesus? There's a great bit of difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone. You know, Jerry mentioned my wife uh, today, and, and my wife is on uh, the worship team at our church at home, and so she's there today. And um, uh, But uh, my wife and I, we've been married 43 years. 43 years. We were really young when we got married. Denise was 18, I was 12. And, uh, well, no, no, it, well, almost. I was 19. Denise was 18. I was 19 years old. Been married 43 years. She's my best friend. When uh, uh, when we were in Bible college, Denise was on the the uh, in the choir, and she took voice lessons, and she has a beautiful voice. She she's a, a great great singer. And so we we're in Bible college. Once people found out she sang, they'd invite her to their revivals to sing. They invite me to come preach. They invited her to sing. They let me lead in silent prayer maybe at the end of the service. You know. but, but I could talk to you all day about Denise. But it, well, you'd have to meet her to get to know her. There's a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. Jesus says, 
Come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. Learn from me. Jesus invites us into a relationship. You will never exhaust the knowledge of Jesus in your life. I'm learning things now that I didn't know before. I'm confident I'll keep learning until the day I meet Jesus personally. But what's this idea? What's this whole this thing? Take my yoke upon you. Well, most of you have studied this passage. You know that that yoke was that that piece of wood that was put over the shoulders of the oxen in order to what? Share the load that the oxen together working together would have greater strength, even greater strength than the sum of their individual efforts. But that was the idea of the yoke on, on the oxen. But the, the phrase here says this, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What does it mean to say easy? A.T. Robertson in his great book on the word pictures of the New Testament says this, easy is a poor translation. Sometimes in bringing the Greek into the English, it's hard to put just one word that would adequately describe what we're talking about here. The word here, easy, can mean kindly. It can mean good. It can mean useful. There are burdens that we carry that are useful. So uh, next, or actually this coming weekend, my grandson and I are uh, going to Conneaut, Ohio for a D-Day reenactment. I didn't, uh, my grandson and I are both kind of World War II buffs, so we just, it's one of those things we kind of enjoy doing together. And, um, and so right now I'm reading a book about D-Day. And uh, I, I, I was just finished reading a chapter about the planes that uh, flew in the paratroopers. These guys were so brave. I mean, you know, they're dropping out these planes that are just basically floating tar targets coming in there. And so in, in reading this, I want to know a little bit more information about parachuting. Now, let me ask you, I asked this question at, at our church uh, uh, last weekend. I'll ask you this. Have any of you here been skydiving? One person. Like on purpose? I mean, you went and did it. I mean, you, uh, you actually like took a class and jumped out of a perfectly good plane. And, and, and we just uh, jumped out. Just jumped out. Now, were you doing the tandem one, or did you do it? Okay, yeah. But still, you jumped out of a plane, fourteen thousand feet and twelve thousand feet. Not on my bucket list. Just telling you right now, not not necessarily on my bucket list. I was reading about. Um, I was reading about parachutes. The, the average parachute actually weighs, counting the, you know, the harness and everything and the backup chute. I was telling somebody, I want a backup chute to the backup chute. I, you just, there's not enough backup chutes to get me out of that plane. But the average harness, parachute, and everything together weighs about 45 to 50 pounds. Now, most of us would not just enjoy walking around with 45 to 50 extra pounds on us, right? I do have a friend of mine, uh, th th this guy, he's a fitness buff, and uh, he's, he's also one of those guys, and uh, food, and he's very, you know, he's lean, he's mean, he's, he, he's a fitness buff. I was at the gym a couple of years ago, and he was there, and he's, his name's Jimmy. And Jimmy was working out. He had a weighted vest on. He was not only lifting weights, he was wearing 
a weighted vest that had 30 pounds of weight in it. I said, Jimmy, I can tell you how to put on 30 pounds and you won't have to worry about that vest. And Jimmy smiled at me. He's pretty sharp. He smiled at me and said, yeah. He said, but I can take mine off and hang it up in that locker when I'm done. Nobody puts on this kind of, you know, these kind of things just to walk out, walk around. But if you're going to jump out of a perfectly good airplane at 13,000 or 14,000 feet, that 45 to 50 pounds is what? Good and useful. What's my point? There are some burdens in life that are light, that are easy. You know, somebody said the only thing harder than living for Jesus is living without Jesus. We like to think we're strong. You know, when you're young and you just life is going good, we can handle anything, and then life just socks you a couple times. And, and Jesus says, Come unto me. Come unto me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. The Bible says we can cast all of our cares upon him because why? He cares for us. I've got some friends that are atheists and, you know, uh, and, and they're young guys and they're pretty cocky and, and uh, every once in a while they say, well, that, that Christianity, that's just for weak people. I say, amen. That's right. That's right. When I'm weak, he's strong. Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. There's the invitation. Here's the promise. I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. There's a rest that we experience that the world doesn't know anything of. Now, it is desperately trying to find it. It is desperately trying to find it. I was talking with Tony before the service, and the nonprofit that uh, the Life Enrichment Center that he mentioned uh, serves um, homeless folks, serves people, and many of those people have mental illnesses, and many of those people struggle with addictions, and they're trying to make it through life and trying to figure it out however they can. And a lot of them are self-medicating. They're looking for rest and they're not finding it. And we got people all over there looking for rest. They're not finding it. And they get hopeless. And this is why many of them just give up on life. Jesus said, I'll give you rest. Rest from what? Rest from carrying the guilt and the shame of our sin? You see, Satan's such a deceiver. Satan's such a liar. He will tempt us into sin, and then when we do sin, he will accuse us. Jesus says, come unto me. Come unto me. All you that labor are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. It's interesting, if you look at the text, he mentions rest here two different times. He says, I will give you rest, and you will find rest for your souls. What is it? Why is there this different? I will give you rest, you will find rest. Jesus gives us rest when we come to him and accept Christ as our Savior. He gives us rest from our striving and our, our trying to atone for our sins ourselves, which we can never do. He says, I'll give you rest. You don't need to worry. You don't need to fear. Where are you going to spend eternity? Have I been good enough? We can never be good enough. 
Bible says it's by grace that we're saved, through faith, that not of ourselves. It's a gift to God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we come to Jesus just as we are. The Bible says God commendeth his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We come that way. Jesus said, I'll give you rest. But then he says, you will find rest. Jesus didn't say, okay, you come to me, your sins are forgiven, you're going to heaven when you die, that's all taken care of. Listen, I'll see you on the other side. I'm afraid that's the way many Christians live their lives because the only experience they can talk about the experience of Jesus, their experience of salvation when they were saved, what's Jesus done for you this week? What's Jesus doing for you right now? How's Jesus helping you with the load that you're carrying right now? Jesus said, I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. And the fact is, God doesn't remove every storm for our life, does he? Sometimes we just have to go through them ourselves. But God does do this. God does do what this. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So my question today to you is this. Are you bruised? Are you just about to snap? Are you kind of like that flax that's just barely smoldering? Is light just about going out? Jesus says, come to me. Learn from me. I'll give you rest. I want us to bow our heads for a word of prayer. I'm not sure what your tradition is here, and certainly uh, we want to respect that, but also I want to give you the opportunity today, if you need to come, to pray, to cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. Maybe you need to have someone come and just pray with you. We don't have to know everything a person's going through to pray for them, do we? We can pray for them. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You know about God. You know about Jesus. You've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You've never repented of your sins personally and put your faith in Christ. We want to give you the opportunity to do that. Scripture says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none of us righteous, no, not one. And that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you'll confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Scripture says you can be saved. Call unto Jesus today. Come to Jesus today. And Father, we thank you for the promise of your word. We thank you for uh, the invitation that indeed you get us, you understand us. Thank you for the gentle ways that you deal with us, even in the midst of our brokenness, our sinfulness and our suffering. You don't cast us aside. Father, I pray for my friends that are here today that are carrying such heavy burdens. Probably things that no one else knows about, but you know about it. Help us to cast every care upon you because you care for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet?
Secretary, I'm not sure. If, am I to go ahead and dismiss or? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. As we're uh, let, as we're going to dismiss in a word of prayer, I, I'm going to have you just bow your heads and we're going to pray together. I wonder. And this just helped me to be able to pray for you in the church here. I wonder how many of you today would say, Randy, I've got a burden. I've been trying to carry this thing myself, and I'm I, I'm not doing really well with it. I need to cast this burden on the Lord because I know He cares for me. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me as I? I just lay this upon the Lord. You don't need to tell me what it is, but just slip your hand up by that saying, Randy, pray for me. I got a burden. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you all. God bless you all. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be with the good folks here at uh, Beacon of Christ Church. And I thank you for the light that they are shining in this community. Continue to bless their ministry. I pray for my brothers and sisters who raised their hand, all of us have heavy burdens right now. Thank you that you are gentle and lowly in heart. You're not bothered by us coming to you. You're not disappointed that you're coming to you. You welcome us with open arms. Bless this church. Bless these folks in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody have a great week.